Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here at Medicos and, uh, and uh, I'm especially excited, of course, to be part of this symposium, um, which is about ways to obtain more self-regulating ecosystems also here in the Mediterranean. Um, and my, I've been asked to give this uh, kind of introductory perspective, uh, deep time perspective on ecosystems and rewilding in the Mediterranean region. And I'll do that coming as an outsider because I've actually not worked very much in the Mediterranean, although like many other northerners, I'm certainly a fan. Um, so, and the starting point here, I'll focus on trophic rewilding and trophic rewilding, um, let's see what goes on here, can be defined as species introductions to restore top-down trophic interactions and associated trophic cascades uh, to promote uh, self-regulating biodiverse ecosystems. Um, and it's, it's uh, one way to define rewilding with the most uh, prevalent other one being what I term passive rewilding or passive management, which is simply hands-off management. You don't do anything, you step back. In many parts of the world, that's totally un uncontroversial. That's how you do uh, deal with nature reserves. But in Europe, that's a strange idea. Um, and these two uh, perspectives on rewilding, they actually interlink in the sense that, that as part of passive management, you may have spontaneous restoration of top-down trophic effects via wildlife comebacks. Um, and I put spontaneous here in a, a quotation marks because spontaneous often involves some kind of political or practical in terms of corridors or so on. Uh, um, actions to promote a comeback. So it's actually not that, so it's a, it's a gradient from, from directly introducing species to promoting that they come back to not doing anything in terms of the trophic aspect of the restoration. Um, and the trophic, re, trophic rewilding has been inspired by all the work that has been coming out in, in ecology since the seminal work of of pain on the role of top-down effects in food chains in structuring ecosystems and the realization that uh, large-bodied animals play a particular role um, in, in terms of generating these top-down effects. And, and there's a lot of studies that have shown strong top-down uh, trophic effects of large-bodied carnivores and large-bodied herbivores. And you can see some of the cases here, for example, with a very famous uh, trophic rewilding example of the reintroduction of wolves to the Yellowstone Park after they had been exterminated as vermin uh, in the early part of the 20th century, redu uh, reintroducing them back to restore their top-down effects on, on ungulate populations, which has been uh, reported as a, as, a, as a major success in affecting both the densities and the behaviors of, of the ungulates, as well as the mesopredators affecting all kinds of aspects in the ecosystems, although there's also a lot of complications to say about that. Um, and uh, linking up to the introductory uh, keynote for, for the Medicos meeting here, I just want to point out that thinking about these uh, top-down effects are particularly relevant in a Mediterranean con uh, context because uh, this kind of uh, climatic setting here is in this part of the world that can be classified as ecosystems uncertain, where consumer control either via uh, large-bodied herbivores or fire can have very big impacts on ecosystems and cause shifts between tree-dominated uh, forested more or less ecosystems to grass or shrub-dominated ecosystems. So um, also trophic rewilding has been very inspired by a sort of deep time perspective with the realization that all across the world in pretty much all kinds of terrestrial ecosystems until quite recently, uh, rich megafaunas have been the norm. You heard about that if you heard Anna Travisett's uh, talk on the Mediterranean islands, for example, but it's true basically for any terrestrial ecosystem. Just a few thousand years ago, there were rich megafaunas, like you know from Africa, pretty much everywhere. Um, so this is, for example, European interglacial, North America, South America. Um, and, if you look, and, and this is a map that shows the, the magnitude of the extinctions around the world in, in a recent late quaternary time frame. What it shows is the, is the proportion of large-bodied animals, mammal species, more than 10 kilos that have gotten extinct, basically within the last uh, 50,000 years, but in prehistoric times. Um, so very large proportions in the New World, 
parts of, of Europe and certainly Australia, and, but actually everywhere, but less so in Africa. Um, and, and the black areas here are just areas that were excluded from this analysis. Um, and uh, these extinctions have been, have been uh, the cause of these extinctions have been and are still very much discussed whether it's climate change or, or, or the expansion of modern humans. But actually, if you look uh, at, at the macroecological pattern, it's very clear it's not linked to climate change, it's linked to, to modern humans very clearly. Um, but that's not so important from a rewilding perspective. Another key point is that these extinctions that occurred towards the end of the Pleistocene at different times in different places and at different sort of um, temporal speeds continued through the Holocene to varying degrees in different places. But for example, in Europe, it's been a sort of dripping extinction starting 30,000 years ago and just continuing uh, species dropping out uh, every so and so few thousand years. One of the later ones is the European wild ass, which had a very big distribution in, in the middle and late Pleistocene. It's very closely related, perhaps conspecific with the Asian wild ass, um, but then gradually uh, fragments and declines through the, through the Holocene and goes extinct maybe a few thousand years ago, but maybe surviving here in the Iberian Peninsula until like 500 years ago, but the latter is a little bit uncertain because it's only based on, on, uh, on text information and toponyms. Um, if we look at, if we think from a functional perspective, we can, we can quantify uh, the, the losses of these megafaunal losses in terms of losses of diversity in megafaunal functional groups that have importance for ecosystems. So you can look, for example, at mega herbivores, that's herbivores at least one ton, which are pretty much uh, resistant to, to top-down control themselves and have very large, can have very large influence on vegetation. This is the current sort of optimistic mapping of those, uh, th their diversity based on IUCN. Um, and this is, this is what the pattern would have looked like uh, if there had been no extinction but adjusting the distributions to the modern climate. Uh, so very different. Um, and the same here for, for, for herbivores between 45 kilos and 1,000 kilos. The, cur the, the, the current situation, again, somewhat optimistic from IUCN. Um, and, the, and the natural situation, you can say, and the same then here for large carnivores. So big losses of all these functional groups that have, have a potentially big <coughs> ecosystem importance. Um, another key point that I want to make is that these rich megafaunas were not something that had arisen and, and, and emerged in the late Pleistocene or something like that. They had been typical for tens of thousands or millions of years, and you can see that on this uh, figure here from, from a study by Phyllis Smith on maximum body mass in mammals. So here you have millions of years back in time. Here's 66 million years ago. That's where you have the end of the non-avian dinosaurs. And then you have the different continents. And you can see that after 20 million years on all continents, you have really large-bodied mammals. And basically, um, on any continent within the last 20, 30 million years, if you look at terrestrial fauna, they, they have these kind of rich uh, megafaunas uh, with large-bodied animals to more than one ton, like you also some, those of you that attended the Paleo Symposium, for example, the other day also saw examples of from here. And this is actually from here 12 million years ago. Um, so take-homes on the megafaunal extinctions are that they are completely, or at least very predominantly, anthropogenic. They're extinctions without functional replacement. Uh, and they're highly unusual, they have left us in a highly unusual situation in most places on an evolutionary time scale in terms of having just small things around deer, kangaroos, stuff like that. So what's the relevance for ecosystem function and landscape management? Uh, well, a first perspective is that the species that we have in our ecosystems, the species that we study in our modern day ecological studies, are old and much older than, for example, European cultural landscapes. And you can see it here. These are typical species ages for extant species of mammals, beetles, trees, and vascular plants put on a Pleistocene or Quaternary time scale. So millions of years back in time here. And you have the glaciations and interglaciations here. Holocene is up here. Uh, so mammals are typically several of hundreds of thousands of years old. Like ourselves, we are 200,000 years old as a species. Uh, beetles are typically way more than a million years old. Trees, vascular plants, most of the extant species go hundreds of thousands to millions of years back. Another, another point that I want to make is that uh, 
that we do see, we don't have a lot of evidence for the ecosystem consequences of the megafauna extinctions, but the, but the studies that we do have point to that they have had strong effects. And one that's particularly interesting from a, from a Mediterranean perspective is a study from northeastern Australia that showed that uh, from the last interglacial more than 100,000 years ago until 40,000 years ago, you had a system with a lot of large herbivores uh, and a mix of open areas and fire sensitive and fire tolerant trees, then the herbivores go extinct over a few hundred years or a few thousand years they are lost. You can see that from the Spromiella fungal record. And you, within a few hundred years you get a shift to a fire driven system that you then have chronically afterwards. You lose the fire s sensitive trees, you get lots of grasses and you suddenly get a lot, you have permanently lots of fire in the system after that. Uh, one, uh, one, uh, one ecosystem where I, where I have done uh, empirical work myself in this area is concerns Nemoral Europe, where we have had a long-standing discussion on whether the natural uh, vegetation is really closed forest, which is a standard, uh, standard understanding, or it was more some kind of semi-open wood pasture-like system due to the actions of the, of the past megafaunas. Um, and one way we addressed this was using beetles as indicator species. There's a nice, we mined a nice da paleoecological database from the UK where, which has a lot of beetle records from the, from the, from the late quaternary. And beetles are nice because they're very sp many beetles are very specific depending on, for example, dung from large herbivores, depending on certain structures of trees and so on. And we looked at four periods. So, so the cultural landscape, the last 2,000 years, um, the early Holocene prior to agriculture, but after the extinction of at least the really big megafauna species, the, gla the last glaciation where climate overall limited the amount of trees you could have in the system in Britain, although climate varied through time. Um, and then the last interglacial where we had a climate more or less as it is, as, as it is now, um, with rich megafauna, as you can see here on the British Isles, and actually no humans at all in the system. <laughs> And what we find, you can see here, these are proportions of sites falling into ecosystem categories according to how much stung they have and according to the vegetation structure. And here you have the last interglacial, the glaciation, early Holocene prior to agriculture and the cultural landscape here. So you can see in the cultural landscape, most sites fall into the high dung category where you have at least 2.5 large herbivore per hectare. So many animals around and we know that's how it was. A lot of grazing was going on in this landscape. You can see much lower, uh, air, much lower proportions of high dung in the early Holocene, but still more than 20%. Um, and then if you look to the last interglacial, 50% of the sites fall into this. So they had a lot of large herbivores around, at least at these beetle sites. Then if we look to the vegetation reconstructions, you can see from the last interglacial, it's not reconstructed as dense forest overall. It's a mixture of forest and more open and semi-open uh, habitats. Um, and less forest than in the early Holocene where you had lost the really big animals, for example. And here's a reconstruction from a site in Wales from the last interglacial. So you have the red deer there, you have oaks here, temperate oaks, you have fallow deer, but then you also have hippos, rhinos, elephants, and spotted hyenas, for example. In the, in the last years, there's been coming out a broad range of studies that point to the ecological impacts of the past megafauna and and, the, and their losses from tropical forest with uh, studies on the effects on seed dispersal, effects in terms of, of slowly declining uh, distributions of, of megafaunal dependent uh, trees, effects on carbon sequestration from savannas comparing South America to Africa, showing that the loss of megafaunas from South America explain why they have more wooded savannas, um, and general work showing how the megafaunas have affected uh, spatial nutrient dispersion capa capacities. Um, but much more work needs to be done there. So, what about the specific med Mediterranean um, perspective? So, a key point here in the Mediterranean region is, of course, that we have this uh, very uh, pronounced process of land abandonment, as you can see here in this figure, for example, with active rural population and decades here and all the, all the Mediterranean countries north of the, Med, of the Mediterranean Sea have this very pronounced decline in active rural populations and you see land abandonment all over. And of course land abandonment uh, 
is, is not something that's only occurring here. All the green areas have land abandonment, so you can, it occurs <coughs> widely around the world, but not exclusive. You kind of have two parts of the world, parts where it's land abandonment and parts where, where, where it's not happening. Um, and of, it's, it's of course, uh, from a societal perspective, it sounds terribly negative, but of course for, for biodiversity, it's actually good news, right? Because the main driver of endangerment today is habitat loss, as you can see here in the yellow bars for, for birds, mammals, and mollusks, for example. Um, so land abandonment is providing space back, you can say, to species. So overall, it's good news. Um, but of course, it's complicated. And one, one key point here is that land abandonment may be linked to displacement of ag agricultural pressure to other regions and can cause losses there. So it's not so simple. So if we produce, so the soybean that we use for pig production in Denmark, for example, and we have five times more pigs than people, is produced in South America to a large extent, for example. So maybe it was better that we produced it ourselves. But that kind of thing, it's, it's complicated. On a local to regional scale, also, as, uh, as shown in this, uh, in this figure here from uh, re related to cork oak savannas here in, we in the western Mediterranean, it's argued that you have sort of a unimodal response of ecosystem services and biodiversity to human use of the system, where abandonment actually leads to losses of certain ecosystem services and biodiversity. Um, and this is linked to the fact that there's actually a major proportion of Mediterranean biota, as everybody here knows, that's related to, to open or mosaic habitat. It's not all forest species, of course. Um, so how can, how, can, how can these species be maintained in a situation where, where you can say with passive management we have, um, we have a, a strong succession towards tree-dominated systems? Of course, uh, the classical option, which is still also an option on the table, is to simulate or subsidize traditional land use that kept areas open in, in the cultural landscape. And an alternative is this rewilding approach that is a topic of this symposium. And you can say with passive rewilding, a, a good question is whether the wildlife comeback, for example, is enough to maintain these systems, whether all the heterogeneity that's in landscapes from, from soils, from hydrology, topography, and so on is enough Often we think about this in a very, in a too simplistic fashion when we think about how, how things will evolve. So maybe that's enough. We do actually don't know, I'd say, uh, enough about this at least. But the alternative is to say, okay, we actually, actually introduce uh, large-bodied fauna into the system to help maintain uh, open, openness in the system, for example, and also for other effects. And here again, I just want to highlight that in the Mediterranean area, we are actually in this kind of climate setting where we expect consumers, either, either herbivores or fire, to play a very big role for the kind of, of actual ecosystems we get. I also want to give you a specific deep time perspective on the Mediterranean. Um, and a, a first point I want to make here is, of course, like everywhere else, species are old, most species are old. And that also in, that's also true for open habitat species here. You can see, so I have a, a history working with palms, so so uh, I would point out here that our palm here in the system, the European dwarf palm, is old and has, has separated out from its, its uh, nearest uh, sister, sister taxa more than five million years ago. Uh, and is so this, this, and it's a very open habitat uh, adapted species. So it's been there for a long time. If we look at a very classical open habitat genus for the region, the cystus, we can see that it has evolved sometime in the Pliocene several million years back and has diversified ever since then through the late Neogene and through the Pleistocene. So, so, so there's apparently clearly been uh, a lot of uh, available habitat for it all through that time. Also, it's interesting to, to, to directly take the, to make use of the paleoecological record, for example, the, the, the very extensive pollen records that we have, especially maybe for, 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 for the northern part of the Mediterranean region, such as here in Spain. Um, which consistently for the quaternaries show uh, mosaic vegetation. So the overall picture is, uh, is a mixture of tree-dominated areas and, and open areas. And this is, a, this is the classical site of Atapuerco. Um, and this is from a warm period. You can see here, for example, deciduous quercus here. You have phagus, uh, 
you have uh, olive here and so on, so it's not, it's not cold. And here you can see the balance between black bars, tree, tree pollen and herbaceous pollen. And that clearly shows that this system um, was, sim was semi-open in some fashion. And of course, when you then think about that during most of the Pleistocene, uh, this situation so warm was a little bit, was rather unusual. That's maybe for 10 or 20 percent of the time. The rest of the time it was colder and drier. Not really cold from a Scandinavian perspective, but colder and drier. Um, and of course, there the climate helped keeping things open. Uh, but a good question is how was this maintained? How much, can we, how much can we explain from climate and soil? I'd say likely not enough. Likely we need more factors likely we need herbivores and or fire to help explain this. If we look to regarding megafaunas, we also for this region consistently find rich megafaunas. You can see here a reconstruction from a site near Malaga, uh, both of the vegetation and the megafauna from for, from for 50,000 years ago during a sort of a mild period during the last ice age. So mosaic vegetation, rich megafauna. And here you can see a reconstruction of the fauna from the Atapuerca site at, a, at an interglacial period. And you can see again reconstructed mosaic vegetation and very rich megafauna. A more well-known stuff here in, this, in the foreground and then elephants in the back um, and a mallard there as well. Um, and, and one point I want to make is that elephants have been ubiquitous in the Mediterranean system until like 30,000 years ago. Elephants immigrated out of Africa and arrived in Europe 18 million years ago, and since then, we've always had elephants in the system. In the Mediterranean area, they have been continuously in that whole time, but also elsewhere in Europe. Of course, shifting species, often several species at a time, but shifting species, but we've never been without elephants until the last 30,000 years. So it's really a novel thing. Uh, you can see here that rich megafaunas is not just a quaternary norm, but it's also a neogene norm. You can see here reconstruction of faunas from Greece and, uh, and Bulgaria, but it's the same for Spain from like from, from nine to three million years ago um, and even further back. Um, and again, also note the vegetation. Also saw that in the Paleo Symposium the other day where you could see that at this site near Madrid at a time where there was clearly more moist subtro subtropical climate than now, one of the main uh, ungulates uh, as prey was a grazing adapted uh, horse species, for example. So. Lots of it, and also you could see that the carnivores were somewhere adapted for, 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 for or some were clearly foraging in the open and some in the forested areas. So this mosaic uh, habitat and these rich megafaunas have been the norm for millions of years. Uh, so, so I think from, from taking this deep time perspective, it's, it's, we can say clearly open habitat and mosaic ha adapted species have been there for a very long time in the system. They're not something that has evolved with the cultural landscape. Um, also, we can see directly that open ha mosaic vegetation has been the norm in many, many, in many parts. Not to say that everywhere, but as a, as a general thing. And we can see that rich megafaunas have really been the norm until quite recently. Then I want to say a bit about status and priorities for tropical rewilding science. Since, uh, since this is a scientific meeting, of course. So first of all, uh, it's, it's quite uh, nice uh, to see that there are so many uh, traffic rewilding projects happening, especially in Europe, but also elsewhere. Um, this offers uh, a lot of uh, opportunity for studying the impacts, of course, as a, as a, as a, as a key thing. Um, let's see. And, that's a, and that's, a very, that's a key point, what you can see here. Is, uh, is based on a review that we did a couple of years ago on, on, on rewilding science, so looking for, for publications that specifically address rewilding. Um, and what you can see here, the literature categories, I think you can't read them, but this says essay and opinion piece, and this says review. So these two, so, so this is the very dominant uh, type of literature on rewilding. These ones here are experimental and these ones are non-experimental non, are, are non -experimental empirical, but we need much more of these, right, rather than more discussion whether it's a very dangerous approach or it's uh, whatever, pros and cons. We need more empirical work. Um, also, it's very clear that there's very strong biases in, in, the, in the studies that have been done geographically. Um, uh, and also, if you look to the literature, there's, 
it's very scattered what you have, so it's very fragmented what we know about the impact. So we need a lot more empirical research for passive rewilding. I think the key question is, is it sufficient to maintain high biodiversity? And the studies that come out are somewhat conflicting or multifaceted there, and it will depend on what organisms you look at and so on. And key issues for trof trophic rewilding is uh, what role does uh, trophic complexity have? How, how much does it matter to have a certain functional diversity in, among herbivores, among carnivores? What's the interplay with the landscape setting, <coughs> interplay with human activities? And of course, thinking ahead, what's the interplay with climate change? Um, yeah, and I just briefly want to touch on, uh, on the issue of risk in relation to introductions. Of course, one should have a systematic approach for selecting which species to use, so it's not just ad hoc what species you put out. Um, and that needs to be better developed. In terms of really, we should build on previous experience with reintroductions, of course, and if you have really novel cases, really new species for the system, should do small-scale testing, careful monitoring, and so on. And of course, when we talk about risks, it's also very important to benchmark risks against other risks because we don't live in a risk-free society. So we move species around and, and, uh, and soil and so on for agricultural, horticultural, pets, and hunting purposes and so on. So, so risks need to be benchmarked against that. And so with that, I'd like just to make some conclusions. I see really big scope for tropical rewilding in a Mediterranean context. There's space for it given the land abandonment. There's promising empirical background from paleoecology, modern day megafauna ecology, and also from the practical management side. But we need a lot more research for establishing paleoecological baselines, understanding the role of past megafaunas there, and on trophic rewilding specifically. And of course, practical projects are a key uh, opportunity to do it. Um, and, of, and also, we need a lot of more work on passive rewilding and the impacts of that. And with that, I just wa want to thank you for your attention, thank my collaborators and my funders. So, thank you.